This was not the first such test, of course. As devastating as the 9-11 attacks were, it's hard to imagine what it must have been like to live through the Civil War. We read about this in our history books. The debates about the horror of black slavery, the secession of the southern states, a war in the homeland that ultimately claimed the lives of at least 620,000 soldiers and 50,000 civilians and left broad swathes of the countryside in ruins. But we can't really feel what it was like to experience. Under these circumstances, a president many, including me, most revere, also made choices that broke constitutional boundaries. Lincoln unilaterally suspended habeas corpus in 1861 and then again in 1862, despite a rebuke by a federal district court presided over by Supreme Court Justice Roger Taney in the case of ex parte Merriman. Over 130,000 civilians were arrested and detained without habeas corpus by Union military forces as a result of Lincoln's suspension of the writ. Congress only later ratified the suspension in 1863. Although Congress ultimately ratified Lincoln's invocation of the suspension clause, that action did not determine whether civilians detained by military forces could be subject to military commissions under martial law. This is a significant question because a military commission can proceed without all the constitutional guarantees for the accused that are available in a civilian court. A soldier on the battlefield who deserts his post, for example, at least under older versions of military justice codes, could be summarily tried and executed by a commanding officer on the spot. The question whether a civilian could be tried by a military tribunal was tested in the 1866 case of ex parte Milligan. We might imagine that people in the North uniformly opposed slavery and supported the war, but that is not so. One faction of Democrats, labeled Copperheads by their Republican rivals, agitated for a peaceful settlement with the Confederates. The purpose of Lincoln's suspension of habeas corpus in large part was to silence Union dissenters such as the Copperheads. In 1864, Union General Alvin Peterson Hovey in Indiana placed a number of prominent Indiana dissenters under military arrest, including Harrison Dodd, the head of a secret pro-slavery society called the Order of the Sons of Liberty, Lambden Milligan, a lawyer who was a member of a related secret society called the Knights of the Golden Circle, John Bingham, editor of an Indianapolis newspaper and head of the Indiana Democratic State Central Committee. Horace Heffron, editor of another Indiana newspaper called the Washington Democrat, and a number of other copperheads and dissidents. The key defendants, including Milligan, were arrested September 18, 1864, put on trial for conspiracy, insurrection, and other charges starting on October 21, 1864, and convicted on December 10, 1864, a neck-snapping pace. Milligan, along with two other defendants, was sentenced to death by hanging on May 19, 1865. Meanwhile, in January 1865, a federal civilian grand jury convened in Indianapolis to consider charges against Milligan, but did not issue an indictment. Nevertheless, the government continued to hold Milligan and planned to proceed with the military execution. At the same time, the war was in its final phases. On April 9, 1865, Confederate General Robert E. Lee surrendered to Union General Ulysses S. Grant at the Appomattox Courthouse. On April 14, 1895, President Lincoln was fatally shot by John Wilkes Booth. On May 9, 1865, following additional surrenders by Confederate generals, President Andrew Johnson declared the insurrection virtually at an end. And on May 10, 1865, Confederate President Jefferson Davis was captured. Milligan's counsel filed a petition for a writ of habeas corpus in Indiana federal court on May 10, 1865. While the petition was pending, Milligan's execution was postponed for two weeks, and on May 30, 1865, President Johnson commuted Milligan's sentence to life in prison. Milligan's petition subsequently made its way to the Supreme Court. The court sided with Milligan, and thus Milligan regained his freedom. According to the court, no usage of war could sanction a military trial in Indiana for any offense whatsoever of a citizen in civil life in no wise connected with the military service. The court further warned of the dangers of eroding the rule of law based on the exigency of war. Martial law established on such a basis destroys every guarantee of the Constitution and effectively renders the military independent of and superior to the civil power.
the attempt to do which by the king of Great Britain was deemed by our fathers such an offense that they assigned it to the world as one of the causes which impelled them to declare their independence. There are other precedents we could consider from the Civil War and subsequent American wars and conflicts through World War I. But let's fast forward to World War II. There was no combat in the American homeland during World War II, but there was activity involving foreign spies. The fear of foreign spies and insurgents spilled into an irrational panic at times. This irrational panic led to the very dark episode of the internment of over 100,000 Americans and non-citizens of Japanese origin in camps during the war. We'll come back to that episode and to the infamous case it spawned, Korematsu v. United States, when we discuss race discrimination next semester. There also were episodes in which ordinary German Americans suffered unjust harassment and violence. At the same time, there was German U-boat activity close to the coasts of the continental United States, there were German spies in the States, and there were American citizens who collaborated with the Nazis, even if this activity was relatively isolated. One such episode involved a Nazi plan called Operation Pastorius. The operation intended to sabotage the American economy by damaging hydroelectric plants at Niagara Falls, aluminum plants in Illinois, Tennessee, and New York, as well as river locks, railroad facilities, and industrial plants in Pennsylvania, New York, and New Jersey, including Penn Station in Newark. The operation was to be run by eight English-speaking Germans who had previously lived in the United States. One of them, Ernest Peter Berger, had been a naturalized U.S. citizen but had returned to Germany and joined the Nazi party. Another, Herbert Hans Haupt, also was a naturalized U.S. citizen and claimed that he never renounced his American citizenship. After Nazi spy and sabotage training outside Berlin, they were delivered to the U.S. in two separate U-boats, one off a beach in Long Island and the other off a beach in Florida. The landing party in Long Island was discovered shortly after coming ashore by a Coast Guard patrolman, but escaped capture, sparking a national FBI manhunt. The plan was betrayed three days later by one of the spies who landed in New York, John Dash, who turned himself in to the FBI. Dash claimed that he hated the Nazis and had used the mission as a means of defecting to the U.S. After all eight of the spies were captured, President Roosevelt issued a special executive proclamation establishing a military tribunal to prosecute them and others like them. The proclamation stated that the safety of the United States demands that all enemies who have entered upon the territory of the United States as part of an invasion or predatory incursion or who have entered in order to commit sabotage, espionage, or other hostile or warlike acts should be promptly tried in accordance with the law of war, and ordered that all persons who are subjects, citizens, or residents of any nation at war with the United States, or who give obedience to or act under the direction of any such nation, and who during time of war enter or attempt to enter the United States or any territory or possession thereof through coastal or boundary defenses and are charged with committing or attempting or preparing to commit sabotage, espionage, hostile or warlike acts, or violations of the law of war, shall be subject to the law of war and to the jurisdiction of military tribunals. The petitioners filed writs of habeas corpus seeking to be tried in civilian courts rather than before President Roosevelt's military tribunal. The Supreme Court ultimately denied those petitions. They were convicted by the military tribunal and sentenced to death. Dash and Berger's sentences were commuted, Dash to 30 years in prison and Berger to life because they had cooperated with the FBI. The other defendants, including Haupt, were executed on August 8, 1942 in the electric chair. In 1948, after the war had concluded, Dash and Berger were granted clemency by President Truman and deported to American-occupied Germany. They were scorned as traitors by many Germans even after the war. The court in Quirin first noted the President's broad authority as Commander-in-Chief generally, and specifically under the Articles of War Congress adopted against Germany, including the power to convene military tribunals and to try offenders against the law of war. The court then made some distinctions under the law of war. Note that the court's reference to the law of war here refers to customary international law, legal principles that are part of the universal agreement and practice of nations rather than codified by Congress or in specific international treaties.
Much of the customary international law of war today is reflected in international treaties, including the Charter of the United Nations. The court first notes that the law of war distinguishes between armed combatants and peaceful civilian populations of belligerent nations. Certain actions in war are lawful in relation to armed combatants that are unlawful in relation to civilian populations. Most basically, an armed combatant on a field of battle can lawfully be killed, while steps must be taken to avoid and limit the killing of unarmed civilians. Further, the court noted, the law of war distinguishes between lawful and unlawful armed combatants. This may seem a bit counterintuitive. How can it be lawful for anyone to take up arms against the United States? Remember, the question is what is lawful under the international law of war. The international law of war does not consider all war warfare illegal, nor does it privilege one nation over another. Rather, it seeks to constrain war by limiting the circumstances and means by which war can be prosecuted. Further, the law of war seeks to protect the individual dignity and rights of ordinary soldiers, including those who are fighting under the flag of a nation, like Germany under Hitler, that may have initiated a war in violation of the law of war. One of the protections under the law of war for lawful combatants involves their treatment if they are captured in battle. It does not require that they have access to the writ of habeas corpus, because they are not entitled to ordinary criminal proceedings with attendant civil rights in civilian courts. It does not, however, permit them to be tried by military tribunals. Rather, they may be held as prisoners of war and treated humanely until the cessation of hostilities. This rule is intended to prevent the summary execution of soldiers who surrender or are captured in battle. Of course, even in the modern era when the law of war has been in effect, many prisoners of war have faced severe maltreatment, torture, and summary execution. But such actions technically are war crimes. In contrast, the court stated, unlawful combatants can be subject to trial and punishment by military tribunals. So who is a lawful versus an unlawful combatant? A soldier in uniform fighting as part of a recognized national armed force is presumptively a lawful combatant. Beyond that, things get murky. The court noted that the spy who secretly and without uniform passes the military lines of a belligerent in times of war seeking to gather military information and communicate it to the enemy, or an enemy combatant who without uniform comes secretly through the lines for the purpose of waging war by destruction of life or property are familiar examples of belligerents who are generally deemed unlawful combatants. The court further noted that the entire category of combatant distinguished this case from Milligan. Milligan and his compatriots were not associated at all with the armed forces of the enemy, and therefore were not combatants at all, but merely civilians who may or may not have committed ordinary crimes. The court therefore upheld the trial of the Operation Pastorius defendants in the military tribunal, paving the path for most of them to the electric chair. Quirin held that an unlawful combatant may be tried by a military tribunal without a right of habeas corpus. Another World War II era precedent, Johnson v. Einstranger, addressed the right of combatants held in military detention outside the U.S. to habeas corpus in civilian courts. Germany surrendered on May 8, 1945. The surrender required all forces under German control to cease active hostilities. The war between the U.S. and Japan, however, continued until August 15, 1945, after the Americans dropped atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki on August 6 and 9. Prior to the use of the atomic bombs, it appeared that Japan might continue fighting indefinitely, and the U.S. prepared for a massive ground invasion of Japan. Some committed German troops sought to continue fighting against the U.S. and travel to China or other locations to assist the Japanese Imperial forces. Among these were a group of German radio officers who were captured by U.S. forces in China, tried for war crimes by a U.S. military tribunal, and repatriated to Landsberg Prison in Germany, which was under U.S. military control. They petitioned for habeas corpus in U.S. federal court. They argued that their continued imprisonment in a U.S. military prison violated the international law of war because, as prisoners of war, they should have been released from military custody after the cessation of hostilities. The U.S., of course, did not want to release them for trial in German civilian courts because the U.S. and its allies were just beginning the process of determining how to rebuild Germany and its institutions after the Nazi era. The Supreme Court held that these prisoners were not entitled to habeas corpus, 
because they were enemy aliens who were captured outside of the United States, tried by a military commission outside the United States for offenses committed outside the United States, and imprisoned outside the United States. The court noted that if such prisoners were allowed access to habeas corpus, the writ, since it is held to be a matter of right, would be equally available to enemies during active hostilities as in the present twilight between war and peace. President Lincoln's actions during the Civil War and President Roosevelt's actions during World War II represented high watermarks, perhaps at times flood stages, in the exercise of presidential power during wartime. 